Well, uh, hello everyone, and welcome to the final installment of the International Macro History Online Seminar Series for uh, 2023. Uh, today, we'll uh, experiment with a new format. So uh, uh, we're going to have a discussion on the book by Bob Hetzel on the Federal Reserve and New History, uh, discussed by uh, Professor Michael Bordo from Rutgers University. Bob was formerly at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and uh, both uh, both of them uh, were members of the Money Macro uh, uh, series in Chicago, which was run the seminar run by uh, Milton Friedman. Um, so they go back uh, quite a lot in, in the history of the Fed. So uh, without further ado, we'll begin with the presentation by uh, Bob. Uh, you have 20 minutes. I remind the audience uh, to put their questions in the Q&A. And the questions could be directed either to uh, Bob or to Mike. And after 40 minutes, uh, we'll open up the floor for discussion. So uh, Bob, uh, the floor is yours. 20 minutes. Oh, do, do I see my picture or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're, oh, yeah, you're, good. You're on, you're on. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, um, I'm going to divide my presentation into two 10-minute parts. The, the first part is what I hope you will learn from the book. And the second part is just to give you some idea of what, what the narrative uh, in the book is like. Um, it's 700 pages. It's a heavy lift, but... I, <laughs> Uh, the world is is in, is in trouble now. If we have another great recession, uh, if we continue to have monetary instability, we're real we're, we're really in trouble. Okay, and and, and the book is uh, takes us through the Powell uh, uh, FOMC, and so you know the questions can deal with anything from the founding of the Fed all the way through uh, into current current monetary policy. Okay. What principles about the optimal monetary standard will one, should one, learn from reading my book, The Federal Reserve, A New History? How does the book support these principles? That is, what is the methodology for sorting out causation? A review of the history of monetary policy since the founding of the Fed shows that underlying trend inflation is indeed a monetary phenomenon. Both price stability and economic stability require a rule that controls money creation. <clears throat> but how can that be? <clears throat> the Fed does not have a target for either bank reserves or a monetary aggregate. The monitor's program of Milton Friedman organized around the ability of monetary instability to predict macroeconomic instability and the ability of trend money growth to predict trend inflation just seem irrelevant now. In general, the quantity theory seems like an anachronism. Fed spokesmen insist that the FOMC does not follow a rule. Their argument is that on an ongoing basis, monetary policy needs to be adjusted to a changing structure of the economy. There certainly is no support for the Friedman monetarist rule of steady money growth. So, I believe there is a need for a re-exposition of monetarism to make it relevant. Just like the 1930s, quantity theorists lack a theory of money stock determination that attributes its control to the Fed and thus explains how and why the Fed controls inflation. The default op option now is that the Fed controls slack in the economy and moves the economy along a Phillips curve to balance off low inflation and a socially desirable low rate of unemployment. The re-exposition here of monetarist principles, which I call Wixellian monetarism, must be relevant for a monetary policy that uses the interest rate as its instrument and still distinguishes between money and credit. It must also recognize that since the deregulation of interest rates in the early 1980s, there is no longer a satisfactory empirical measure of the liquidity demanded by the public, or at least a widely accepted measure. This re-exposition emphasizes pr procedures that provide for monetary control as distinct from money targeting. And I wanna emphasize that point. A monetary rule 
can provide for the control of money creation without explicit targets for money or reserves. Such procedures do require a rule that disciplines the public's demand for money by maintaining the expectation of price stability. <laughs> the rule also must discipline the Fed's supply of reserves and commercial banks' deposit and money creation through procedures that allow, that allow the price system an unfettered ability to control real variables, output, and employment. They do so through procedures that cause the funds rate to track the economy's natural rate of interest. In doing so, the Fed avoids the macroeconomic equivalent of price fixing with the associated destabilizing emissions and absorptions of money. However, what is the point of even thinking about a radical reform of monetary policy based on discredited monetarist views? Well, the answer is that such a monetary policy is in fact conservative and based on an historical understanding of what sort of policy produced monetary and real stability in the past. Wixellian monetarism, my re-exposition, formalizes the monetary policy that restored price stability in the Volcker Greenspan era. <clears throat> this policy disciplined both the demand for money and money creation. It did so through the basic lean against the wind procedures of William McChesney Martin, disciplined by preemptive changes in the funds rate intended to prevent the emergence of inflation. Initially, with the start of the Volcker, uh, after the start, after the end of the Volcker disinflation, the bond market vigilantes reinforced that discipline. Once the FOMC had restored credibility for price stability after 1994, Greenspan based such preemptive changes on overheating in labor markets. Of course, any rule based on lean against the wind procedures, which requires that the FOMC determine whether the economy is growing unsustainably fast or slow, requires judgment, of course. Nevertheless, restoration of the expectation of price stability in the Volcker Greenspan era required consistency of policy over time. That is a rule. Moreover, that consistency required abandonment of an activist policy of aggregate demand management with its attempt to balance off the conflicting goals of low inflation and low unemployment as dictated by an exploitable Phillips curve. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the FOMC lacks systematic procedures from learning from past experience. The reason is that the culture assumed necessary to preserve its independence prevents it from ever admitting that it makes mistakes. And if you don't admit that you can make a mistake, you can't learn. The contrast between the results of the Burns-Miller-Powell policy and the Volcker Greenspan policy should make Wixellian monetarism an obvious choice. The FOMC needs to stop caricaturing any rule as mechanical and to admit that it needs to communicate in terms of the underlying consistency of monetary policy. That consistency, the rule, should be conditioned by an understanding and examination of past experience. So, understanding the monetary standard requires a model that makes abstractions, especially whether the price level is a monetary or a non-monetary phenomenon. Does price stability require the control of money creation? The required abstractions are not evident from direct observation or from reading newspapers, but only through validating the predictions of a model. The model must guide how to sort out the two-way causation between the, the behavior of the Fed and the behavior of the economy. That is, it must solve the simultaneity problem. <clears throat> there is a need for Fed histories that work out a methodology for identifying causation in the correlation between nominal and real instability, and that make the required model predictions, predictions that must hold when con concatenating all episodes of macroeconomic instability. And attributing the business cycle to instability and money 
Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz focused on the pro-cyclicality of money growth and on the observation that peaks in money growth preceded peaks in the business cycle. A methodology relevant for the period after 1980, when real money demand became interest sensitive and when the empirical measures of money, M1 and M2, no longer captured the liquidity demanded by the public in its asset portfolio, needs to work for the entire history of the Fed. The book focuses on the way that the Fed maintained short-term interest rates at cyclically high levels well past cyclical peaks. For the pre-1981 period, this attribution of real instability to monetary causes also accords with the Friedman and Schwartz identification in terms of the behavior of monetary instability. So to summarize, what causes monetary the monetary disorder that produces real disorder? F1 procedures are stabilizing when they cause the funds rate to track the natural rate of interest and destabilizing when they do not. Introducing cyclical inertia into the Fed's lean against the wind procedures for setting short-term interest rates, the funds rate now, prevents the FOMC's baseline lean against the wind procedures from tracking the natural rate of interest. The optimal monetary standard should provide a stable nominal anchor in the form of the expectation of price stability. It should also give free reign to the price system to determine the behavior of the real economy. These principles incorporate the quantity theory hypothesis, the th hypothesis that the price level is a monetary phenomenon. They also incorporate the monetarist hypothesis that the price system is stabilizing as long as the central bank does not interfere with its operation. Okay, that's the summary of what I hope people will get uh, from, from the book. Now, so... Um, Nathan, how much how much time do I have to get into the narr actual narrative? Yeah, about eight, uh, ten minutes. So, sounds good. Okay. Prior to the creation of the Fed, the United States was on the gold standard. Under that standard, market forces determine the interest rate, money, and the price level. All that changed with the creation of the Fed because the Fed did not follow... Uh, gold standard rules and when it when it uh actually gained its independence in 1919 uh there was no international gold standard the monetary standard changed to one of fiat money creation the great disasters of the pre-world war ii period followed from the failure to understand the change in the monetary standard and how the changes there was changes changed the responsibilities entailed for the control of money and prices. So the founders of the Fed wanted to end financial panics, which cut off borrowers, uh, uh, which cut off bank borrowers in the interior, in the interior uh, of the country from the credit that was ordinarily available from, from banks in New York and Chicago. To that end, they designed the Federal Reserve based on real bills principles. A core principle of real bills was that the collapse of episodes of speculative excess caused recession and deflation. The founders of the Fed believed that the Federal Reserve banks <clears throat> could prevent ex speculative excess by allocating credit to legitimate uses only. In the 1920s, the original intention proved illusory namely the growth of credit would be based only on the discounting of real bills, that is short-term commercial paper. It was based on things like gold inflows. In response, the New York Fed developed a policy of economic stabilization based on the control of total bank credit, presumably before it grew to the point at which the presumed inevitable collapse occurred. Because the guiding principle remained the need to squelch incipient signs of speculative excess, the Fed became an engine of economic disaster. <clears throat> In the 1920s, real bills operating procedures meant that collectively member banks would always be kept uh, in, in, in the discount window. That is, the reserve supply, would the non-borrowed reserve supply would be less than reserves demanded. 
That would presumably guarantee the Fed's ability to restrain the total amount of credit by controlling the cost of credit to be just sufficient to provide for the productive uses of credit. As a result of these procedures, the level at which the regional reserve banks set the discount rate plus the non-pecuniary costs to borrowing from the discount window determine the marginal cost of bank reserves. No one understood the consequences of these procedures. The Fed believed that maintenance and stability required the suppression of the speculative excess that furnished the precondition for recession and deflation. In response to the dramatic rise in the stock market in 1927, starting in 27, the Fed raised the cost of reserves to banks through open market sales and increases in the discount rate. Now, commercial banks in the interior had adjusted their reserve positions through the call loan market in New York, using deposits at their correspondent banks, especially in New York. They also used the discount window. The Fed shut down the first uh, recourse to the call loan market as a presumed source of funds for, for speculation in the stock market. It significantly limited the second, the discount window borrowing, to the policy of direct pressure. High discount rates and the stigma attached to discount window borrowing as evidence of bank weakness caused banks to try to restore their liquidity by building up excess reserves. <clears throat> The banking system could only do so, so through contraction of loans and deposits. Because of the stigma <clears throat> associated with borrowing from the discount window, the banking system <clears throat> adjusted to the bank runs that began toward the end of 1930 and continued into 1931 by contracting loans and deposits rather than by borrowing from the discount window. Throughout the entire Great Contraction, August 1929 to March 1933, monetary policy remained contractionary because of the incessant pressure on the banking system to contract. <clears throat> okay, when, when, when you're uh, listening to an economist speak, you should always have the mute button at the ready. So how much time do I have or am I out? Nathan? Uh, you have uh, yeah. another four minutes, four to five minutes. Okay. Okay, so with the bank holiday of March 1933, bank panic ceased. <clears throat> As banks accumulated excess reserves, they no longer had to borrow from the discount window. With the resulting, with the resulting end of the Fed's primitive free reserves operating procedures, Fed control over interest rates ended. The monetary standard changed to one in which the Fed controlled the reserves of the banking system through its open market purchases, first of securities, and then through gold inflows uh, uh, from abroad, which the Fed monetized, and with the marketplace therefore setting the interest rate. After the United States devalued the gold, the dollar and pegged the price of gold on January 31, 1934, the country ran a commodity stabilization scheme for gold financed by the monetization of the purchases by the Fed. So gold flows weren't being sterilized. Okay, they, they passed into the monetary base if the treasury didn't sterilize them. There were two major supply shocks in the 1930s, one in summer 1933, with the National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, and one in 1935 with the Wagner Act, which both of these produced an exogenous rise in wages, uh, which produced an exogenous rise in uh, inflation. In, in 1936 and 1937, to eliminate excess reserves, which presumably were the tender for renewed uh, speculation, the Board of Governors raised reserve requirements and induced a sharp contraction in the money stock. In the Depression, no one understood the Fed as a central bank with the power to create fiat money, that is, a, as a creator of money. No one had the concept of a banking system with nominal liabilities resting on a reserves, reserves base maintained through the bookkeeping operations of a central bank. The Fed presumably worked through its control of, over financial intermediation which was stymied, presumably, by the lack of demand uh, by banks for, for credit. Now, with uh, World War II and the failure of depression and deflation 
to resume after World War II, real bills uh, no, was no longer relevant. The real, the real bills presumption was that because the credit base had been built up uh, on a structure of, of government securities rather than real bills, it would collapse with the end of the war and uh, recession and deflation did not return. So that was one factor. And then uh, because the Fed was uh, still under the thumb of the Treasury and was required to um, keep a limit on uh, the uh, uh, long-term bond rate, how high, uh, how high it could rise, uh, with the uh, Chinese invasion of uh, crossing the Yellow River in, in fall of 1950, uh, the world anticipated a, a, a return to um, uh, the commodity shortages, price rationing, and inflation of World War II. So inflation soared, and the Fed was forced to uh, buy uh, securities that were being sold to it by banks and the insurance companies. So the Fed, it was obvious to everyone that the Fed was fueling inflation by fueling uh, reserves creation and, and uh, bank um bank uh, bank lending and, and so uh in, in response uh William McChesney Martin who became uh FOMC chairman uh 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 after the March 51 accord uh he and his assistant Winfield Riefler uh invented the lean against the wind procedures that became the basis for uh, uh post-war macroeconomic stabilization okay that's my half hour it's been great fun uh and again, um, when it comes time for Q&A, the, the book uh, goes through the Powell, uh, uh, the Chairman Powell uh, period. So um, feel free to ask questions about uh, any, uh, in, 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 any part of Fed history. Okay. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, that was great. So uh, we'll move over to uh, Mike, who's going to comment on, on the book. So Mike, the floor is your 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Um... So before I start, I should say uh, that I've known Bob a really long time, like maybe 100 years. Uh, we were graduate students together at the University of Chicago. So this this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, I think I'll cover the whole period he did in my comments, so uh, you'll know how we got to the to the present. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, so so Bob's written a, a very important book on the history of U.S. monetary policy. Uh, it follows the illustrious narrative approach of Friedman and Schwartz, the monetary history of the United States, and Alan Meltzer's A History of the Federal Reserve. But unlike the earlier books, it's based on, on the modern macroeconomic theory based on rational expectation that was first pioneered by, by Bob Lucas in 1972, but also... He incorporates the theoretical ideas that come out of out of Richmond, the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, where he was he was a he was a member for 50 years. And when you think of who was there, it was Marvin Goodfriend, who was really a, a, the powerful intellect that is part of this of this background story. So the next slide, please. Yeah, so he uses the narrative approach of Friedman and Schwartz and 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 Romer and Romer. Uh, to view the, the history of business cycles under the Fed as, as semi-controlled experiments. And as I said, the, the analysis is based on two sets of tools developed at Richmond. Okay, the first is the microeconomic analysis of the connection between Fed policy and the money market, which is often referred to as the plumbing of monetary policy. And secondly, the good friend King macroeconomic New Keynesian model 1997, which is based on the assumption of sticky price setting. And as Bob said, the strategies required to make the Fed's real policy rate approach uh, the Wick cells natural rate of interest. And he, his framework applies to three distinct policy regimes. Uh, Pre-World War II, the Fed regime based on the gold standard and real bills that he talked about the post-World War II regime from 1951 to 79, based on the leaning against the wind, LAW, he calls it, strategy developed by Fed Chairman William McChesney Martin, and then the Volcker Greenspan regime that goes from 1979 to 20, 2006, of leaning against the wind with credibility. He, he carries it beyond to the present. So next slide. Yeah. So 
the Federal Reserve is, Act is based on the re, on the gold standard and real bills. And under the gold standard, the Fed's supposed to maintain gold convertibility and follow the rules of the game, as did earlier uh, European central banks. And under real bills, uh, were the Fed to only rediscount self-liquidating real bills and avoid speculating uh, and, and avoid uh, financing speculative assets, there'd never be a surplus or a shortage of money or credit. And so what, what Bob posits is that the Fed was not constrained by its here, adherence to the gold standard, as were the pre-World War I European central banks. And he says that once the Fed gets going after World War I, it's the first modern central bank to be on a fiat money standard. And the reason he argues is that the Fed, U.S. is a large, relatively closed economy, and the Fed could easily uh, sterilize gold reserves. Um, and so the key failure for the early Fed was that it did not base its policies on a reaction function. Um, and by that, he means he, it didn't change its policy rate based on deviations from price stability and real economic potential. Instead, it mistakenly based its policies on the real bills doctrine, and its sole function was to prevent speculative excess. Next slide. Okay. So now I, I could quibble with this a bit. I could challenge Bob's closed economy approach with a lot of evidence that the international capital markets under the interwar gold standard were as efficient as before World War One. This is work I've done with, 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 with Ronnie McDonald a long time ago, and that the U.S. really wasn't that closed. It was influenced by international monetary forces. And I think that means that you've got to take into account the global gold standard approach of, of goes back to Jacques Rueff, Bob Mundell, Barry Eichengreen. It's not there, but I think it's important. And at the least you could say is the U.S. is a large open economy with imperfect capital mobility, as I discussed with Anna Schwartz and Chowdhury a long time ago. And the Fed really followed a managed gold standard. This gets back to Friedman and Schwartz. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on, on the early Fed, again, he follows Bruner and Meltzer with Dave Wheelock, Alan Meltzer, in arguing that based on real bills, the Fed began a tight monetary policy in early 1928 to stem the Wall Street boom, leading to the contraction of 29 to 33. But unlike Friedman and Schwartz and Bernanke that followed and Meltzer, uh, Bob views, uh, based on the on on the Richmond Fed plumbing model, um, is that that all of it, the, all of the great contraction, is due to Fed tight monetary policy, and he downplays the role of the four banking panics that occurred from 1930 to 33 as the key reason the great contraction was so severe and protect. And he's highly critical of Ben Bernanke's thesis, for which he won the Nobel Prize last year, that the banking panics led to the collapse of financial intermediation. So I think that at the very least here, you need some, we need some evidence, empirical evidence, which confronts the voluminous international historical literature, which suggests that financial crises controlling for other factors can both cause recessions and make them work. And this is the work I've done with a lot of work we've done with Chris Meisner. Um, so I think he needs to, he needs, this needs more backing. And it's particularly so in the face of the moderate, a moderate rise in policy rates before 1929 and a massive decline in the money supply that didn't occur until the banking panics began. Next slide. Okay. So, the post-war regime is called leaning against women with trade-offs. He's very complimentary to the Martin Fed for adopting the reaction function approach to monetary policy making, that the Fed would adjust its policy rate through an indicator it call, used called the free reserves, and that would offsite, offset business cycle shocks. But because the Fed waited for inflation to rise before beginning to tighten the up in, in the upswing of the cycle, its exit policies would be too late. And lots of people have shown this. And this goes back to Friedman. I've done lots of work on this. But what the Martin Fed did was, was, um, was it worked for a while in the sense that the recessions were quite mild in this period. But, but after 1965, as Bob tells us, 
the Fed really, Martin Fed really contributed to the great inflation, which followed for the next 18 years. And the story he tells here on the great inflation is pretty similar to that of other Fed historians. The Fed accommodated the expansionary fiscal policies of the Johnson administration. And then following Phillips curve logic, it led inflation take off. Next slide. Okay. Okay. Um, and like Meltzer, he's highly critical of Chairman Arthur Burns for, 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 for attributing the 1970s run up inflation to cost push forces and for advocating wage price controls. And then for caving in to political pressure by President Richard Nixon. Um, but again, in this discussion of that period, there's not much discussion of, of the rest of the world. And there's the possibility that Nixon's abandonment of the gold dollar, gold peg in 1971, August 7, may have had a role in the de-anchoring of inflationary expectations in the 1970s in the U.S. and everywhere else in the world. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So then his third regime is, is leaning against the wind with credibility. And uh, he sees this, and I agree with him, that the Volcker shock of 1979 was another watershed in Fed monetary policy making. And he praises, uh, and I 100% agree with him, and he praises Volcker and Greenspan for creating a regime of credibility for low inflation. And he nicely describes how Greenspan used the bond market, which quickly incorporated expectations of future inflation as its intermediate target. And this is the whole story of the bond market vigilantes, which the current Fed threw out the window. So the, the Volcker Greenspan regime created the great moderation of low and stable inflation and good real performance that goes from the mid 80s to before the global financial crisis. And success, as Bob says, is because the Fed followed rule like policies. And I, it, I threw the Taylor rule in there, but it, it, it didn't have to be the Taylor rule. Next slide. OK. So he getting to the global financial crisis. He attributes it to entirely the policies of Greenspan and later Bernanke for keeping its policy rate too high to fend off a temporary run up in commodity prices between 2006 and 2008, which he attributes largely to price pressures coming from China joining the WTO. And he downplays the role that of low interest rates that played before 2000 and into the early 2000s in fueling the housing boom. This is a view that goes to Raghu Rajan and John Taylor and lots of others. He also downplays the subprime mortgage induced collapse of credit market intermediation as the key cause of the GFC. That was argued by Bernanke and others. Next slide, yeah, yeah. He's also critical of the Fed's deployment of numerous lender of last resort facilities to shore up the financial system, which are he, they, he in the Richmond view refers to as credit policy, which is a form of fiscal policy. And so I think that this he has a, he has a, a contrarian view of the great contraction and of the GFC. And I think it, it needs a little more empirical evidence. OK, it, it, I mean, it, it's 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 a, it's a powerful argument, but I think I think it needs more evidence for more people to buy it. And. As with the with the with the the great contraction of twenty nine to it's really hard to attribute a deep down downturn solely to a previously modestly tight stance of monetary policy. Next slide. Yeah. Um, he's also getting to the future to the present. He's critical of the financial market rescue policies that the Powell Fed adopted in the spring of twenty twenty, uh, at, 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 at when with the pandemic as really unnecessary in the face of natural market forces, as we didn't really need to do that, that the market would have would have worked out this because we were we, we were going to have a recovery anyway. But if you look at the decline in credit market spreads after the Fed intervened in the markets like the corporate and municipal bonds, um, that may have had something to do with it. But Bob doesn't agree. So this is, again, another empirical issue that could be uh, settled. So uh, last slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I mean, Bob's book, I, I'm getting into some of the issues that I don't agree with him, but it's a really important book, contributes to the literature and the history of the U.S. month. It's a tough read. Meltzer was a tough read. This one's a tough read. 
Meltzer was even tougher. Okay, his application of modern macroanalysis gives a new approach to the subtleties of, of Fed policymaking. And I think that the, the, the contrarian views that he has on the, on the causes of the great contraction and the global finance, that, that really is a challenge for future research. So I think that this book should be read by Fed people, by other monetary policymakers, and people, people like us, serious economic historians that study the Federal Reserve. So congratulations for this book. Bob put a lot of time into it, and he deserves his congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for uh, for your discussion and, and, and sticking to time. So we already have some questions in the Q&A, but before we proceed to the Q&A, I... Uh, I, uh, I mean, I'm picking up on the on the on Mike's uh, comments, and and maybe uh, Bob would like to respond to one of the major, what I see the major themes in in the in the in the discussion, is the uh, the kind of the weight you attribute to monetary versus financial banking uh, uh, crisis to. Kind of explaining the developments of the Great Depression and the uh, the, the GFC, so it seems like uh, Mike is arguing that um, um, you underestimated or underplayed some of these uh, banking financial stories, and 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 I guess the audience would like to hear your response to this because I think it was one of the major points of uh, difference. Uh, you're in mute, Bob. Bob, uh, you're on mute. Okay, okay. I think I'm. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So, now you're so yeah. So 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 that was a wonderful overview. Mike obviously spent a huge amount of time on it, and this is a guy who I can't believe he ever sleeps. So uh, so I'm 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 really appreciative, and I agree with everything he said. Um, let me just make a couple points. First of all, I have a bias toward not writing anything where I don't have some value added. That means I shortchanged the international um, context in two uh, significant uh, respects. One is uh, during the uh, great contraction of how deflationary monetary policy in the United States spread to um, the rest of the world, which had restored the the, the, the gold standard. Okay, Eichen Green does a good job of that in his book, Gold and Fetters, and Mike obviously has written about it. Um, and the second area I shortchange is, is the Bretton Woods system and its breakdown, uh, its final breakdown in in 73. So if you want a complete monetary history, um, you need to add the work that Mike has done, not only his own um, papers, uh, but also... Um, uh, the uh, works he's edited. Okay, so let me just say two things. One thing about uh, my interpretation of the Great Contraction, and uh, I'm sorry, the Great Depression, and the other about the Great Contraction. So, so, so first of all, um, about the bank runs. Sure, uh, Freeman and Schwartz focus on that as as the beginning of contractionary monetary policy. I argue that the contractionary monetary policy really began seriously in 1928 when uh, the Fed um, uh, limited the ability of banks to adjust their reserve positions in the call loan market and through the discount window. So that started the initial contraction in the banking system. Um, but the, the bank runs really exacerbated it because uh, they reduced non borrowed reserves, which forced the banks into the discount window. And at that point, uh, given the discount window borrowing not only had Fed stigma attached to it, which was going to uh, uh, initiate uh, a, a visit from your Fed, your friendly Fed supervisor, but it was also a sign of weaknesses. So rather than uh, adjusting to the reserve outflows through um, borrowing from the discount window, uh, the banking system uh, uh, attempted to build up excess reserves uh, through contraction of loans and deposits, and that caused a contraction of the banking system, okay? Uh, uh, again, uh, Mike adds a lot to this. Uh, the second thing about the, uh, the, um, uh, the, great, uh, the Great Depression, the Great Recession, uh, the financial contraction um, of 2008, 
the first thing I, I want to emphasize is that, yeah, the counterfactual is hard, but I think what, what, um, what the, an entire Fed history shows that you never have a recession without contractionary monetary policy. So uh, the counterfactual is what would have happened if monetary policy hadn't been contractionary. Okay. And sure, when there was this surprise retraction of the financial safety net, all the cash investors who had been uh, financing the dodgy uh, illiquid portfolios of the investment banks, they fled to the too big to fail banks like JP Morgan Chase. Uh, and that caused a disruption in financial markets. And I also think because of the instability it created, and at the same time, you had a realization that the whole world, uh, the whole um, industri uh, developed world had entered into a serious recession in the summer of 2008 before Lehman Brothers, um, that instability reduced the natural rate of interest uh, so that it made the existing uh, two percent uh, funds rate even more contractionary than it would have been. So uh, I do emphasize the bank runs in in thirty one, and I do emphasize the uh, credit um, in contract instability in uh, two thousand eight. But obviously, um, uh, so in, in the first case, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with Friedman Schwartz rather than with Peter Tim. And I think if you really want to explain the deflation that occurred in the Great Depression, you, you got to go with real bills. Uh, you, you can't just say like Peter Tim and oh, oh, the Fed was on a gold standard and it's what it had to do to defend the gold standard. OK, uh, Friedman Schwartz had it right on that. And in and, and, and the second period, um, uh, I'm I'm not willing to let the the Fed off the hook with uh, you know uh, a real bills explanation of a collapse in the housing market and how that um, had all kinds of uh, Minsky repercussions, uh, Kindleberger, et etc. So again, I can't th thank Mike enough for uh, uh, his overview. I agree with everything he said, and and I really appreciate the way he um, uh, brought out the. Um, uh, the the controversial issues that that economists are going to need to focus on in, in in the future. So thanks, Mike. Okay, thank you, Bob. We have uh, one question in the Q and A, and I'm encouraging uh, the rest of the audience to uh, put their question in the Q and A. It could be either to uh, uh, Bob or Mike. So we have a question from uh, Bill English, who's asking. Uh, he would like to know, Bob, your, uh, it, how would you write the Fed's monetary policy framework document uh, in 2025 uh, based on your reading of the Fed uh, history? What, what is your view about this? Okay, so first of all, I would make a fundamental change. Um, I think the Fed needs to communicate in terms of, of the underlying consistency of its monetary policy rather than its point in time reaction to what it sees as instability in the economy. Now, monetary policy works through the way in which financial markets understand the Fed's reaction function and how that shapes the behavior of the yield curve in response to incoming information on the economy, news. That is, um, I think the Fed should move beyond forward guidance and, and think in terms of, more in terms of, of a reaction function. That is to go through its, its uh, alternative scenarios and to be clear how it would, how it would respond. Because it, in, if it's gonna have a stabilizing monetary policy, it, it, it's got to condition how the yield curve responds to news. And for that to happen, it has to have a consistency of monetary policy that it could, it um, transmits in the markets. And I believe that, that, that the foundation for a, um, a, a, a new uh, long-term policy strategy should recognize the, the, the need for communication in terms of what is the underlying consistency of of monetary policy, how has it changed over time? And don't just say, "Oh, yeah, you know, it changes in response to changes in the structure of the economy." Go back, read 
look at look at the history and the experiments the Fed has given us and explain why the, the FOMC has chosen that underlying consistency, the rule. Okay, thanks, Bill. So we'll uh, continue uh, with a question uh, from uh, Dick Silla. Um, who's asking that the currently the measures of the U.S. money supply have been contracting. Uh, this is a rare occurrence. Uh, what does it forebode? I'll get that. Okay. So, yeah, Mike, you want to pick that up? or? Yeah, so um, um, first of all, it, it's great uh, to hear from Dick Silla, <laughs> another old player. Um, actually, you're right, Dick. In fact, um, like I've done work on... Work on I, I I've done work on on divisio money, um, and which is you know deals with some of the problems of of financial innovation, and it has been falling, and there's a good chance there is a good chance we're going to have a recession, so you know I think that this is this is uh that there is a is a problem here how big it is going to be how it's going to play out we'll see so can i say something sure sure go ahead Mo. great question so um the starting in march of 2008 the fed monetized a significant amount of the government pandemic monetary payment payments. And guess what? It turns out that there may be a difference in degree, but there's no difference in kind between the United States and Zimbabwe or Argentina or Venezuela. Uh, that was expansionary. Now, the Fed told us, oh, yeah, that was going to release three trillion dollars in new credit. And that would have increased the supply uh, rather, rather than, you know, aggregate demand. So it didn't it, it, it didn't work. So now we have this huge monetary overhang. And and and, we're, and and that monetary hang overhang is being worked off in two ways: one through inflation by by reducing real money balances, and, and one through the kind of uh, the, the reduction in bank deposits uh, and in division measures that that Mike and uh, and uh, Duca use. Um, but at some point, it's going to be it's going to be worked off. And then the Fed had better better have procedures that get back to a, a rate of growth of aggregate demo, nominal demand consistent with um, uh, price stability. And now my concern is it will go back to the 1970s where uh, the Fed is, is slow to reduce the funds rate when, when that overhang works off uh, because it doesn't want to destabilize, uh, it doesn't want the markets to think it's accepted an inflation rate above 2%. So that's why I'm pushing a, a proposal where, where, whereby the Fed would set a um, benchmark, not a target, but a benchmark for the rate of growth of aggregate nominal demand and also its best estimate of what, what the rate of growth for um, potential output is. And the difference in those two series, the difference in the rates of growth has got to be inflation. The difference between the rate of growth of nominal demand and the rate of growth of potential output determines trend inflation. The Fed ought to, um, with each FOMC meeting, provide those benchmarks and explain how its policy over time is going to return us to 2% inflation. Well, thank you. So moving forward, uh, Gordon Holmes is asking, uh, if you can say something or a comment, and I guess both Mike and, and Bob, you can do that, or uh, uh, relate the your narrative of the United States to small open economies like Canada. Does uh, <laughs> uh, does there what 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 would be your advice for them? So I guess both of you can answer this. I know. <laughs> oh yeah, I can I can jump in. Look, I just I just did a paper with Pierre Ciclos on Canada. I mean, Canada's a small open economy, but it's because it's it successfully figured out how to float and follow um, and and follow an inflation target. It's actually done pretty well, and and it's in many respects, in the past twenty years or so, it's done better than the U.S. At least, especially with respect to inflation. But obviously, it's the world is you know I mean the U.S. is big and Canada is small, so there's always going to be there's always going to be an influence, but. 
I think that they, for example, Canada did not, Bank of Canada did not adopt flexible average inflation targeting. And so they did not make the kind of mistakes that the Fed made in the recent period. So in one sense, they did better. The run-up in inflation was less, and now they've 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 actually done a better job of getting it down. And so they're already in the cycle of 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 loosening. So and other small open economies have the same ability, and a lot of them have done so. Look at Australia, New Zealand. So um, if you're a small open economy and you and you and you are and you're able to to disassociate yourself from monetary policy of bigger countries having a float and following rule-like policies, you can do a lot better. Bob, you want to comment on this? or? Yeah, uh, Mike's Canadian, so I'm going to leave um, recent policy to him. But I'm going to piggyback on that and jump back in, in, into the depression, to the depression and Friedman and Schwartz. Uh, I think one really good thing that Friedman and Schwartz do is to distinguish between the source of the Great Depression is monetary contraction as opposed to credit contraction by comparing Canada and the United States. Canada had a small number of large banks. Um, it did not have any bank failures. Uh, there was a credit contraction, there was a monetary contraction, but didn't have the kind of disorder that came from bank failures like the United, like the United States did. And so that's one reason why I think I'm I'm associating with with um Freeman and Schwartz rather than Kindleberger and and Minsky and emphasizing uh the importance of a stable monetary uh policy. And if you have that and if you don't have the kind of moral hazard created by a, a financial safety net which makes the financial system inherently unstable, then you get monetary policy right credit markets can take care of themselves. Wait a second. When you go back to the Canada story, Canada had exactly as bad a fall in real output, okay? It didn't have the banking panics. Why? Because it was on the gold standard. I mean, it, it was not on a pure float. It imported the shocks from the U.S. through the balance of trade and the capital account. So in a sense, and and velocity. So, in you know, it, again, you get to the, it's the international monetary regime is really important here for a small open economy. That's the key. Absolutely, I I I, I agree with that, uh, and and uh, I just want to say one more thing. Um, the, the monetary history is not an archaeological dig. If you if you want to understand optimal monetary policy, you got to go back. And you've got to examine the experiments that central banks have given us. And I think the macroeconomics profession is becoming arid in in many ways. It's missing it's missing in action because um, it's um, ignoring uh, history in, in favor of uh, estimating models. And and if you have ten economists in the room, you're going to have ten different models, and they're all going to they're all going to fit. Uh, through some kind of magic uh, of the computer of how it produces shocks. So uh, I, I just want to uh, thank the, uh, the participants here for spending the time. And I, and I, I think agreeing with monetary history is absolutely essential. Oh, just as a comment, I guess uh, you can put uh, 10 historians in the same room and get 10 different stories as well. But uh, it's not just about economic modeling, but... Uh, uh, but let's move on with the Q and A. So maybe I'll try and unmute. Uh, I, I want to just I, I want to interject one thing. And just take ten seconds. The, sure, you get ten economists, ten economists, ten monetary historians in a room, and and, and you get ten ten uh, arguments. But I, I want to make the point I made when I was the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Richmond of how you discipline that debate that debate through the through. Uh, the methodology of economics. I like to call it trained intellectual gladiatorial combat. <laughs> combat, and that's what we need, and that's why we're here. Yeah, we're all economic historians here, so uh, you're preaching to the converted. But let me un try and unmute uh, Chris Meissner. Uh, Chris, do you want to ask you a question? Hey, Chris. Hello. Uh, thanks a lot, Bob. This is really 
fabulous. I look forward to spending the next 10 years of my life trying to figure out how to uh, understand and read your book. But um, let me uh, just ask, you know, one question that's been on my mind and a lot of people's recently is, you know, the credit boom hypothesis. And you, you mentioned it quickly, Minsky, Kindleberger. Um, it's related to the recent global financial crisis and even the depression. Um, you know, like maybe you can enlighten us a little bit more on like how you think about, uh, you know, where that went wrong versus your view on, you know, uh, you know, what went wrong and what the stark differences are there in terms of kind of empirical predictions and how to think about that a little bit more. Um, that, that's basically all I'll ask today. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Great, great question. I could have handed it to you. Um, okay, uh, starting in uh, 1993, uh, the government, the administration, uh, the housing agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, adopted a policy of um, promoting home ownership. And starting in 1997, uh, house prices really started rising. Uh, because of the relaxation of constraints on the amount of uh, money you had to put down to, to buy a house. Now, given the way that the government restricts the supply of housing, this increased demand for the housing stock increased the price of housing very uh, significantly. And that increased uh, the wealth, household wealth. And as household wealth increases uh, relative to their um, income, I believe that increases the natural rate of interest. So this policy increased the natural rate of interest. Uh, Greenspan did a pretty good job of fo fo following it up. He had steady increases in, in the funds rate and the mo bond markets anticipated that and, and rose. The problem was, when the housing, when it was became clear that the housing market had become overextended in 2006 and 2007, and you got a sharp decline in house prices and housing wealth, and you also began to get a, a, a sharp decline in the stock market in August 2007, all that decreased housing wealth relative to income. That decreased the natural rate of interest. And the Fed was very slow to follow that. It didn't get it right until December of 2008. And the reason it was slow to follow that because of the international inflation shock produced by commodity prices, the rise in commodity prices uh, caused by the integration of the BRICS in, 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 into the world economy. So, so yeah, the housing, the behavior of the housing market is part uh, of the story. But if you want the whole story, uh, you, you, you got um, uh, you, you to deal with monetary policy and not just the credit policy that, that Ben Bernanke uh, is pushing in his book. Well, thank you. So we have time for uh, one more question before we go into the overtime. But uh, so maybe I'll try to unmute uh, Bill, uh, Bill English. Uh, can you... Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so I, I wanted to go back to what, what Bob said in terms of what he would have the Fed do. He talked about they should write down a path for nominal aggregate demand and a path for potential output. And that would implicitly tell a story about inflation and that would then give you information about monetary policy. I would have said the SEP is pretty close to that. It, they write down a path for inflation and a path for growth. They write down trend growth. They write down trend inflation. So, so they're already kind of close to that, it seems to me. I wondered kind of what, what in addition to that, you would want. Thanks. Oh, uh, two things. Uh, just in general, uh, the hope was the inflation target uh, by articulating it 2%, that that would impose a long run discipline on period by period changes in the funds rate that would guarantee uh, 2% inflation. I don't think that the inflation target has served that purpose because of Milton Friedman's uh, long and, and variable lag. So, so we need to go beyond that. And yes, um, the, the, so 
at one point, the the FOMC was was going to try to um, make, and you know a lot more about this than I do, was going to try to make a committee forecast, but that just turned that turned out to be too hard. So 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 the way it ended up is that the forecasts were were individual forecasts based on a quote optimal monetary policy, which sort of builds in the result that you get back to. 2% inflation without making clear the policy. And these individual forecasts, you can't take a particular individual forecast and link that to the forecast for the behavior of the economy. So yeah, the SDP is important because financial markets um, look at the median forecast, they assume that's the chairman's forecast, and then they they, they take that as, as uh, for, forward guidance. But I think we need to go beyond that. I think we actually need to have a committee SEP, a committee consensus F FOMC. And the political economy problem with that is that you're going to have dissents. You're going to have a lot of real debate. The, the, the Fed's going to look a lot more like the Bank of England and this monetary policy committee and, and with the kind of open o, 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 open debate you get. So, yeah, I think we need to stick with the with the SEP. But I think the chairman ought to do the hard work of getting a committee SEP, and he ought to just uh, accept the fact that um, that uh, the he's not going to get his his prestige from 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 speaking for the entire F FOMC. He's going to get his prestige as chairman uh, for uh, talking. Uh, from, from forming an FOMC consensus with significant dissents. And Bill, you know a lot more about this than I do, so I don't know why I'm I'm, I'm talking to you. No, no, thanks, Bob. And, and I think I agree. I liked the consensus forecast too, but but it was just difficult to to get that done with the highly dispersed and big committee, as you know. Yeah, and, and I want to say um and you know you can certainly disagree with this and uh I will I, I went to some FOMC meetings, and I have a lot of respect for the uh, the, the participants. I, I like to call it the world's greatest democratic uh, debating society. At the same time, we do have to deal with the um, dysfunction in the political system. We don't always know that we're going to get appointments to the board of governors of people who are trained in Fed history, who have a deep understanding of Fed history, the kind of understanding that, that, that a Mike Bordo uh, has, uh, or, or, that, or, or that you have. I know you're a historian. So um, I, I think that the kind of debate that would be generated by a committee uh, consensus FOMC, and it would be generated by this proposal for um, a path for nominal output growth and real output growth uh, based on uh, potential. I think the kind of consensus, the kind of debate that that would encourage would be important in making it clear that just like Supreme Court justice or justices are are required to know that they're going to have a whole knowledge of of the history of, uh, of law and how it developed in the United States and constitutional law starting with Marshall. Uh, well, it, it's just, it should be obvious that a, that, that a member of the Board of Governors should have that same kind of expertise. Now, surely, um, you know, the members of, of the Board of Governors are very capable individuals, but that doesn't mean that you aren't gonna get um, uh, uh, the kind of people like you have, you know, like Lee Hoskins and and, and people with, with a real deep knowledge of monetary history and a real um, uh, ability to engage in, in, in serious, serious debate. Uh, uh, thank you. So it's it's time to end the formal part of the of our seminar, uh, slightly over time. Uh, and I'd like to thank you, uh, Bob and Mike, for a wonderful, intellectually stimulating discussion on the on the Fed policies. Uh, I'd like to remind uh, our audience that our seminar series will continue in the in the spring semester. Our first uh, meeting will be on February fourteenth, uh, uh, Valentine's Day. Easy to remember. 
and uh, and we'll see all of you uh, in in a couple months. Uh, now we have a few more minutes in the informal part of the uh, of, of of the webinar, so uh, uh, feel free to stay and ask additional questions. Uh, we have uh, Robert uh, Fargo. Uh, I don't know if he's still on. Yeah, and I can un unmute him to ask uh, his question. Uh, Robert, go ahead. Front that the post Volcker era has been mostly a great success from an inflation perspective, but it's also been a period of growing inequality. So I'm wondering, does the Fed have any role in tackling this? And is there a risk that if it doesn't, or if this issue isn't tackled, that its its independence becomes at risk? Well, let me just say, send me your email. I, I've just finished a paper which I'm calling Capitalism and Equality, where I'm trying to defend free markets and I'm trying to argue a lot of the inequality uh, that we're seeing uh, comes from government policy. That is, if you, if you look at an empirical measure of uh, poverty uh, starting in 1963, we've had an extraordinary reduction in poverty. But yet a lot of families, especially single uh, parent families, are living with housing insecurity, food insecurity. And the reason is because house prices are so high and apartment uh, rentals are so high. And that's because of government regulation of housing, especially in the suburbs that um, uh, requires um, low density housing, but also in, in the cities, which makes it so hard to get a permit for housing that the housing stock has not been able to respond to the increase in the demand for housing. So. I, if you want to, if you want an, a society that increases out wealth over time, there's no question about it. A free market economy uh, is the only uh, choice that we've ever seen that that will do that. That doesn't mean inequality isn't a problem, but if if you're really going to deal with inequality, you have to give people agency. You have to uh, make them able to commit to 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 compete in a free market economy, we got desperately have to deal with education inequalities, and we desperately have to deal with um, housing uh, uh, issues. Uh, those are issues that we have to deal with. But simply uh, going the critique of neoliberalism route and saying, "Oh yeah, it's all good guys and bad guys," and, and the bad guys are these uh, uh, corporate executives who are just trying to fulfill their job to uh, uh, maximize profits, uh, that, that's a terrible way to uh, address complex issues. Wait a second. Just to answer his question, look, the Fed should not get in worry, get involved in diversity, equality, or anything. It should focus on its mandate. Its mandate is macro stability, price stability, stability of real output, and financial stability, and that's it. It's the fiscal authority, the government that deals with that. It's not the Fed. Sorry, sure, I got off on my rant. But, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, one reason, uh, I mean, the main reason I'm studying monetary history is because I think our monetary institutions are fragile in terms of guaranteeing uh, a monetary policy that will support a free market economy. So I'm, I'm coming at this through the... The, the, the free market approach and, and your uh, question about inequality just set me off. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that's the way it is. Uh, talking about if we, you know, I have a couple of questions. I, I, uh, I'm i interested, but uh, so we don't have a lot of time. So maybe I'll just uh, fire one and uh, for both of you. So talking about the mandates of the Fed. Uh, so a question I get increasingly asked in my classes is, uh, what about the Fed's uh, um, assuming role or implicit or explicit of uh, supplying global liquidity and uh, sort of the swap lines we've seen, which is kind of a maybe departure from the more insular policies uh, we saw earlier and whether this is kind of the Fed mandate, is it uh, something that is uh, uh, 
uh, going to persist in the future. Uh, maybe it's a response to the Chinese attempts uh, for monetary dominance, or, or I mean, how's it? Uh, how do you view this whole uh, debate? But, but wait a second. Let, uh, Bob, let, let me answer, and then Bob will uh, jump in and say a lot more. Look, uh, the way I see it, it's part of monetary policy. So they they developed the swap line in Bretton Woods, okay, because they were worried about the dollar. And they, they used swap lines again in the GFC they used them again for the same reason. It's really because their mandate is domestic monetary policy, but the spillovers from the rest of the world can feed back to them. Oh, I, I, I love it. Uh, you know, we, we need this kind of debate. So let me take the other side. In my book, I argue that, that the swap lines have... Um, gone away from their original purpose. And now by extending them to so many countries, they've been become part of the international financial safety net that creates moral hazard and um, promotes risk taking. So um, the, the, uh, the swap lines are just one piece of the part of how before going into 2008, we had a financial uh, a fragile financial system, not just in the U.S., but worldwide because of the worldwide carry trade uh, in, in which um, uh, investor, uh, investors uh, were, were using the cash market to uh, uh, invest in long-term uh, uh, dodgy uh, portfolios. And, and and a lot of the European banks were buying uh, these tranched uh, subprime securities, and when being clear that they were uh, they weren't uh, viable, yeah, these banks were these banks were in trouble, and they were also financing a lot of international trade by borrowing short uh, 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 from 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 the money markets uh, funds to finance this longer term. Um, uh, credit extended uh, to finance uh, trade. So uh, after Lehman, when, when it looked like the financial safety net might be significantly retracted and go from too indebted to fail to too big to fail, uh, there were a lot of stresses. And so, you know, the, the, the Fed bailed out these foreign banks. Uh, uh, now, is that the role of, uh, 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 of the Fed? It, it, it is... Uh, 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 bailing out a, a, a carry trade, uh, part of providing liquidity. My own feeling in the 2008 is that the Fed, yeah, we we, we definitely needed to keep uh, uh, the the large systemically important the G C banks uh, from uh, from having problems. But we should have started doing what we started, but what, what we did in. January of 2009, we should have pushed the fund, the, the discount rate to zero, and we should have flooded the market with liquidity, buying short-term uh, uh, securities. And that's also what we should have done in uh, March of 2020, I think. So yeah, M Mike makes a good point. I you know, if you're uh, uh, September 15th, 2008, and you've got this financial uh, fragile financial um, uh, system that, that's uh, replete with moral hazard. Uh, yeah, you got a real problem. And, and, you know, maybe Bernanke just did what he had to do. He had to undo the flight of the cash investors from uh, Goldman Sachs uh, and, uh, um, uh, and you know, going into J.P. Morgan Chase. But look, uh, this whole system didn't just happen overnight. It was a real mistake to bail out Bear Stearns uh, in March of 2008, it was not systemically important. It was a bit player in, in, in among the investment banks. If we had let, um, if we had done with Bear Stearns what we would done had done with Lehman, then it would have been clear to the Merrill Lynch's uh, 
of the world and to the layman's of the world that they were really going to have to restructure, restructure. They were going to have to take hits and get financing from the Korean Development Investment Bank and so on. But they weren't willing to do that because they thought, oh, yeah, you know, the Fed will bail us out. Well, when they didn't, it was disastrous. And, and sure, there was a lot of instability in, in the credit markets. And that was a real problem. But the Fed needs a long-term strategy, a long-term rule discipline for moving away from uh, uh, the the system in which uh, 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 market discipline is not allowed to um, uh, cause a bank to fail. We really need to take seriously Title II and Dodd-Frank and the living wills, and I don't think we are. Okay, so on this uh, note of debate, we we it's a good time to end uh, this discussion, which was uh, uh, very stimulating and uh, leaves us with uh, you know two points of view to kind of settle. And uh, so, I'd like to thank you again for uh, joining us this evening here in Geneva, and hope to see you uh, in a couple months. Okay, I, I agree with Mike. That, I agree with Mike that my book is a heavy lift. I hope now that people will use it more than than as a doorstop. I hope they'll actually <laughs> read it. They should. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep well. Bye. 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 Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Whew.